Hello friends, you know what time it is. It is Jesus on Sunday morning time. Welcome to worship here at St. Philip. Before we begin, a few announcements. One, this Wednesday, we are having Ash Wednesday services at 1 and 6 p.m. This year we are not doing the ashes on the forehead because of COVID, but rather we are gonna have a bonfire and people are welcome to bring a piece of paper with something uh, that's been on their mind, something that's been bothering, something they wanna let go of uh, and give it to God. And when you come, you can give us those pieces of paper and we will burn them in the bonfire. Uh, we will be doing the worship services in our cars and we will have some pieces of paper and pens for you to write your whatever you would like to write and have burned on them you know, during the service. So we're very excited to have this alternative to the imposition of ashes and we hope that you'll join us in parking lot worship at 1 or 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Second announcement, we are doing Zoom coffee hour Tuesday at 10 a.m. If you'd like to join us in this wonderful conversation, please check your email for the Zoom link. Now, if you would like to financially support uh, St. Philip as we continue to do our ministry in the world, you can do so by dropping your check off at the office. You can do so by mailing the check into the office. You can also go on our website or Facebook page and give electronically, or you can text give to the number that is below me right now. And if we're lucky, maybe Alyssa will put some fun number fonts on the screen for the number. Probably not, but we can hope for it. Now, our final announcement before we enter into worship is that on Sunday this afternoon and every Sunday after we'll be doing our BLAST Children's Virtual Sunday School class. So if you would want your young person to be involved in the class, uh, reach out to us and we'll get you the information for the Zoom number. Now, one final announcement is that on Thursdays at 7 p.m., Vicar Amelia Collins will be leading her spirituality and um, art class. Recently, they've been talking about the, the Roman catacombs and all the images that uh, fit in from the Old Testament and the New Testament that are found in the catacombs. So we will hope you'll join us for that on Sundays at 7 p.m. We'll make sure you have the Zoom link. Now let us enter into our time of worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us closer to Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who was full of compassion. Fountain of living water, Pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healer and restorer of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven. And God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, so that truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
Our first reading is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah kept watching, crying out, Father, Father! the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. 
and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could ever bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the clouds there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. I'm guessing most of us um, aren't even sure what that means. This event is not really up there with Advent and Lent. It's, it's just the last Sunday in this ambiguous time that we call the season after Epiphany before Lent begins, which is this week with Ash Wednesday. But what is Transfiguration Sunday about exactly? What does it celebrate? The Transfiguration of Jesus is a unique happening that is recorded in the Synoptic Gospels. Therefore, it's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Unlike many other events, Jesus did not announce that it would happen. The disciples certainly did not expect it. It was never repeated, and there doesn't appear to be any Old Testament prophecy foretelling it. The Transfiguration is considered one of the five milestones in Jesus' life, along with his baptism, crucifixion, and resurrection, and ascension. To transfigure means to change or to transform. We might best uh, understand it as Jesus' true nature, his, his divinity, his godliness, momentarily being seen while he is still on earth, revealed to Peter, James, and John. For a brief moment, Jesus is transfigured, transformed, his holiness unveiled and witnessed. This is what the disciples experienced on that mountaintop. Their eyes were open to see God's light in the wake of the chaos to come. Now today's reading is from Mark chapter 9, but the previous chapter gives us some insight as to future events and also speaks of Peter's important declaration. In chapter 8, Jesus asked the disciples who people are saying he was. And the disciples answered, a prophet, John the Baptist resurrected, Elijah come again. But then Jesus looked to Peter and asked, who do you say I am? That was a pivotal question for Peter and it will become an important question for us as we enter into the season of Lent. Peter answers that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. It's the first time he makes that claim. So here we have a major breakthrough for Peter. And Jesus is very, very happy with him. Everyone in the room is happy with him. But alas, the celebration is short-lived. Jesus chooses that moment to reveal the details of the suffering and death that he will soon face and the challenges ahead for the disciples as well. This is no doubt a tense conversation. Jesus is laying it on the line and letting the disciples know exactly what is required of them if they choose to follow him. And that is where our text opens today, not quite a week after that conversation. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain where they witness a most wonderful sight Jesus glorified before their very eyes. Scripture says his face shone like the sun and his clothes were dazzling white. Then suddenly Moses and Elijah appear. As you may recall, both Moses and Elijah experienced the presence of God in their lifetime and coincidentally, both of those experiences occurred on this very mountain, Mount Sinai. 
These two characters have symbolic significance in that together they represent the law and the prophets which are now fulfilled in and by Jesus. So Jesus is transfigured on the mountaintop and Peter, who is sometimes portrayed as a bumbling fool, doesn't know what to do or say. The three disciples are simply terrified by what they see. Peter breaks the awkward silence by first acknowledging the obvious. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here then maybe out of nervousness or sheer excitement, he catapults into action, so, so Peter-like. I could set up a tent for you, Lord, and one for Elijah, and one for Moses, too. But then a cloud overshadows them, and they hear God's voice, the same voice heard at Jesus' baptism. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then the moment is over, and they are alone with Jesus, and he orders them not to tell anyone what they've seen or heard until after the resurrection. Now this passage, though somewhat strange and confusing, provides two very important points to consider. First, the disciples experienced this event as an extremely holy moment. They felt very close to God and, and, saw, and they saw more of God in Jesus than perhaps they'd ever had before. In scripture, mountaintops are often where people meet God. And it is from these encounters that we develop the phrase mountaintop experience. When we're trying to describe an overwhelmingly awesome occurrence. This is what the disciples had at the transfiguration. The second point is that they had a strong desire to stay there remain in that moment, prolong the time on the mountain, rather than to return to life on the ground. We could probably relate to both of these pieces of the transfiguration. We've all had mountaintop experiences in our lives, spiritual peaks or highs, moments where things seem to fall into place and we, and we experience God in a way we normally don't. Times when Everything seems so good and right and meaningful. And we've also experienced a desire to stay in that place, stay on the mountaintop, prolong that experience, even though we know we have to move on, that we simply cannot stay there forever. For me, camping often provides a mountaintop experience. I like to say that there are just two seasons, camping and everything else. In our home, as soon as the holidays are over, Kelly sets a, a, a countdown widget on her phone for the first day of camping. And whenever a day or week is exceptionally long or irritating, Kelly can be heard to yell out, X number of days till camping! And the mood immediately, immediately improves. Before you know it, it's time to open up the camper and head out for the first long weekend. Now the cool thing about camping is that you have choices. You can hook up with friends, meet new people, or just be by yourself, be quiet. There are no rules of engagement. It's all about what you choose to do. You could sleep in or go for an early morning hike. You can have coffee outside your trailer or find the best spot to sit and watch the sunrise. I remember a number of mornings when we gathered around a campfire to read scripture and sing. It's awesome to be outside, surrounded by trees, maybe a lake, depending on where you're camping, cooking and eating together and then enjoying a roaring fire in the evening. What better place to commune with God than in the beauty of nature that he so graciously provides for us to enjoy? But alas, it's time to pack up and go home come down off the mountain. Getting back into the day-to-day -day routine is hard, but we have the next outing to look forward to. Another time to refresh the spirit and rejuvenate the soul. I enjoy that special time, that special place, that special connection with other people, and especially with God. I wonder if there's a camping ministry. Hmm. A pastor by the name of Dan Kimball wrote a book called, They Like Jesus But Not the Church. In the book, 
Kimball references research that claims that people outside the church have a very high opinion of Jesus, his life, his message, but have a rather low opinion of the church, or more specifically, of Christians. Christians, he says, are like pretty scenes trapped in a slow snow globe. They live in a bubble, and they like it there, and they want to stay there. Kimball goes on to say that Christians tend to most, mostly interact with, live near, and spend time with people who are like them and share their beliefs. Instead of being church, they focus on the church as a place where they might invite others to come but are unlikely to bring church, to bring Christ, to others. It's pretty hard to reach others or be reached from inside a bubble. Thankfully, that's not the case in this parish. But can you see where this opinion can hold some truth? When we think about the transfiguration, we can see that Peter's immediate impulse was to create a bubble, to take that extremely holy experience and trap it, keep it, stay there, and dwell within it. And we can hardly blame him. Why would he want such a profound experience to end, even if it scared him and he didn't quite understand it? But at the same time, we have to wonder, what if Jesus stayed up on the mountain with the disciples? What if Moses couldn't walk away from the wonder of the burning bush? What if Mary Magdalene stayed at the tomb instead of spreading the news? What if the shepherds and the magi couldn't tear themselves away from the stable and the Christ child? What if this parish wasn't a loving, welcoming place? What if I'd never gone camping? Undoubtedly, the holy places in our lives are precious. But we are not called to bottle them up or put ourselves in a bubble with them. We're called to take the holy with us. That's why when we talk about our faith lives, we don't talk about a static place, but about faith as a journey. Our faith doesn't stand still. It has to move and grow or it will die. We worship a God whose name is I Am, a living God, an active God, a God always doing, always revealing. And that's why when Jesus calls us to a path of discipleship, he calls us using words of movement, of action. We are told to take up our cross and follow. Perhaps in this moment of transitioning into Lent, we can relate to this idea of wanting to stay in one place, our spiritual comfort zone. But yet, we are compelled to move to another, maybe a quiet place of introspection, looking within. Even though we may feel that it is much easier to stay in a place than it is to move, literally and figuratively, we also know that God isn't leaving us where we are. The question at hand then is, what will we do about it? Will we choose to follow or not? Today we receive the gift of witnessing Christ transfigured, dazzling white, with God's clear voice speaking to us from the mountain, a holy place. But this coming week, we will come down from the mountain into the valley and begin our Lenten walk with Christ to Jerusalem, to the cross, to his death. With that comes hard questions. What will we do? How will we feel? This is our journey of faith, the unfolding of our lives as we take up our cross and follow. And God's all faith-led people say, Amen. Amen.
standing on the promises of God. We pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. O oh God, you call us into community to be ministers of reconciliation in the world. Inspire your church in its proclamation of the gospel and guide its ministries to build up the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you created the earth and all its inhabitants, and you declare that it is good. Protect mountains and valleys, animals and plants, and direct us to be good stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you are our hope in the midst of despair, our help in the midst of sorrow, and our consolation in the midst of affliction. Grant comfort to all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit and support caregivers who attend to all those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. O oh God, you are love, and you call us to love one another. Guide us in our faith practices as we read scripture, pray quietly, and humbly walk with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And so our family in Christ receive this benediction. You are what God made you to be created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. And so may God bless you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Amen. So go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.